It's a very serious conversation. Anti-Semitism in the simplest form is the um, hatred of Jews. I was on a flight to Jerusalem when October 7th happened. It, it, it was hor horrific, uh, and I'm really sorry. Yeah. But, and, and there should not be a but. I wish we could just stand here and, and mourn with you and grieve with you. So um, I don't want to invalidate the trauma. Um, I, I believe it's, it's just traumatic what happened. But for a, for a Palestinian perspective, um, history didn't start October 7th. We have to make sure that when we speak, we begin to speak from a place of love and not hate. You know what I'm saying? Try to not come from all our biases in such a manner that we just begin to push our race and our beliefs more than we push the love of Christ. You know, as an African-American, we live this every day. Hello and welcome to the Theology on Tap with Dr. Antipas Harris and Dr. What's your name? Willard Maxwell. <laughs> you act like you can't talk. No, everybody knows that he's the Joker. Between Wait, the two you were talking. So I was like, I thought you were going to roll with it. Go ahead, man. You good? <laughs> Today is a very special conversation. I'm very excited uh, that we have very special guests here today, and I'll let them introduce themselves in just a minute. But um, I want it's a very serious conversation. Uh, like African-Americans, Jews have struggled for social acceptance on the American soil. Whether Jim Crow's KKK or Unite the Right rally organized by armed white nationalists in Charlottesville, antisemitism continues to plague our nation. Also, American Palestinians, along with Muslims, or experiencing the onslaught of bigotry and hate. Whether 9-11 or the current crisis in the Middle East, the uptick of anti-Palestinian hate and Islamophobia are real. While our guests are a Jewish representative and a Palestinian, the focus of our conversation is racial and religious hate as manifested here in the United States of America. We will not take on the specifics of the crisis in the Middle East uh, in this particular conversation, but we recognize that this crisis has stirred up hate in this country. That is the focus of our concern. The American promise is freedom and justice for all. Hate has no place in this nation or the world. We are here to raise awareness that American ideals are being challenged, people are suffering, even silently. All of us are here because we care about our communities and our collective society. And Eric and Majda are here, great friends, um, to share stories from their communities. And we are here to listen with the heart of love and compassion. If ever we need to have the gift of hearing and listening, it's now. The gift of compassion, the gift of coming alongside, support, in ways that we can to bring our communities together. That time is now. So thank you, Majda. Thank you for having me. And thank you, Eric, thank you. for being here today. Um, we'll start uh, with Eric. <laughs> Eric, what is anti-Semitism? Absolutely, so anti-Semitism in the simplest form is the um, hatred of Jews. Um, what does that look like? It's um, evolved over time. Anti-Semitism is one of the oldest forms of hate. Um, you could trace its heritage really back all the way to the first Jew there ever was, which was uh, Abraham, Abraham um, who invented monotheism. And that distinction, that um, particularism, that, that he separated himself from the rest of civilization, um, kind of created the Jewish people as standing a little bit different, a little bit off. Um, and that distinction has led to anti-Semitism anti throughout the ages. Um, the most common um, form of early anti-Semitism um, was religious anti-Semitism um, that happened um, shortly after the birth of Christianity. Um, Jews um, rejected Jesus, rejected uh, um, the Christian faith. 
um, and were accused of deicide, were accused of the killing of Jesus, um, either themselves involved or manipulating the Romans to, to, to do the act, um, which led um, to the Jews being um, persecuted and killed um, um, for centuries to come. Um, and as, Judy, as, as time went on and um, anti-Semitism morphed, um, it created a, a system where whatever the problem of the day, somehow the Jews were, were found to blame. So for example, during the uh, bubonic plague, uh, when people were dying in Europe, um, the, the Jews were blamed for causing that, um, even though Jews were dying in the bubonic plague. Um, whenever things were going wrong in history, Jews were somehow held accountable for those things that were going wrong. Um, you see that in Nazi Germany, uh, when, when the the woes of, of World War I and the, and, the, and the struggles that happened, they needed someone to blame, someone to scapegoat, and the Jews were blamed for that, for that, for that social um, error and, and ultimately killed for that. Um, and in, in many ways, I think today, we see this idea of the things that are wrong in the world, somehow the Jews are responsible for it. Um, and it, it goes on to multiple different um, kind of systems, right? You, you mentioned the Charlottesville Unite the Right rally, right? That's, that's one form, that's anti-Semitism from the right, where the Jews are responsible for um, the great uh, displacement theory, right? That the Jews are somehow involved in, in assisting brown and black um, people um, in overtaking the white race, and somehow we are um, undermining white, the white race here in America. Um, on the flip side, right, you have this case of Jews, you know, being that, that, that symbol of white privilege, of white power, um, and an elitism, and somehow it's a power, a power indifference um, that needs to be fought. Um, there's a great way of thinking about anti-Semitism um, that, um, that, was, that was introduced um, by a woman named um, Dara Horn, um, who wrote a book called Jews Don't Count, where she described two forms of anti-Semitism. <coughs> One form is when we use um, I'm using some Jewish illustrations to describe it is the the Purim style of um, of anti-Semitism. Purim is one of our holidays that takes place in Persia with a with an evil person named Haman who is responsible for for um, planning to exterminate the Jewish people, right? And sometimes anti-Semitism is very frontal facing. It is we want to destroy you, we want to kill you. Um, that's the anti-Semitism that I think makes. A lot of sense to people, right? People understand that anti-Semitism, it um, it manifests itself in instances like the horrific Tree of Life shooting in 2016, um, when people quite literally want to kill Jews. But she also says there's another form of anti-Semitism, which she calls the Hanukkah anti-Semitism, which is another one of our holidays, uh, which takes place um, when the um, a battle between the Greeks and the Israelites um, in ancient Israel. Um, and their form of anti-Semitism wasn't that we were going to kill you. It's that you need to change in order to be accepted. So only if you reject Judaism, only if you remove your Jewish faith, then you can be accepted into, into, the, um, into the grand people. Um, and that's an anti-Semitism we're seeing today as well, where we're seeing that Jews are being asked to leave some of their beliefs, leave some of their uh, deeply, deeply held I ideals um, at the door if they want to participate in the grand, um, in, in, in grand society. I mean, kind of those two together are, I think, ways that we're seeing anti-Semitism today. Well, I have a follow-up question real quick because there's two things you said. One is it almost the the Abraham mm -hmm. um, uh, about you know Christianity being one of the the beginning of anti-Semitism, -Sem, uh, uh, <laughs> and also I never. I mean, I'm learning right now because I know you all definitely helped our people as far as NAACP, because, you know, uh, it was a uh, Grimmick, uh, last name Grimmick, Archibald Grimmick was one of the founding individuals of the NAACP. But I never really, I never heard the part as far as white race being upset because you all were helping prom promote or enhance um, uh, black and brown people. Like, wow, like, that you get that a lot. I mean, when you said that, I was like, wow. Yeah, so that's one of these, you know, these white nationalist uh, forms of anti-Semitism that we see. Um, if you looked at the shooting, so right after the Tree of Life shooting in Pittsburgh, there was a follow-up shooting at, at, a, at a synagogue in Poway, California. That person who committed that act specifically had on their computer was indoctrinated in these in these theories of the the reason that he committed this act was because the Jews were supporting um, 
this institution called um, the Hebrew um, Immigrant Aid uh, Association, right? They were somehow assisting in bringing in people of color into America and leading to this grand replacement. Um, and um, you know, that, that, that's something, you know, I don't wanna, I don't wanna say that uh, we take shame in any of that. The, the, as Jews, we believe firmly in the belief in, in uplifting all American citizens. Um, of every color. Good. I, I, I'll just, you know, I'll just, I'll just share one other thing, which is, I think people forget this, and because, you know, there's, there's some high-profile Jews. We, Jews are often seen as being um, bigger than we actually are. We, we make up two percent of the American population. Right? We are <laughs> tiny. We make up 0.02 percent of world population. There are very, very few Jews in this world. If you did a, uh, a link of world religions, the most important religions in the world, even though everyone would say Jewish, probably number three we don't compare on the list. Um, and even though we make up 2% um, of the population here in America, uh, we're, um, we receive 55% of religious-based hate crime. And so there's a disconnect here, you know, between the size of our population and what we actually, you know, are accused of and what people think that we are. 2%? 2%, yeah. I learned a lot here, man. Thank you, Doc. Oh, no. I feel like I'm back at Oxford. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I have a follow-up question here. Um, you said that a lot of the anti-Semitism sort of born out of the first century with the idea that Jews killed Jesus. Can you talk a little bit about, a little bit more about sort of that perspective and if you believe that, if there's a sentiment that somehow um, Christianity today sort of, um, I guess this is a hard question, but and re is continually reinforcing that idea. Yeah, so I, I, I can't I can't speak too much about what what Christianity today is reinforcing. Um, you know, I can tell you that with with certainty as Jews, we do not believe that we were at all responsible for the for the killing of Jesus. Um, Jesus was a Jew. Um, he was a person who thought differently. He was certainly rejected by by the by the <laughs> rabbis of his day. Um, but we do not believe that Jews were at all involved in in any form of of um, his persecution and ultimately his killing. Um, that being said, I think I think churches have come a long way in changing some of the sentiment that they had. Um, I'm thinking of Catholic, the Catholic Church has made headway in in coming out vocally against previous accusations they've made against Jews. Um, so I don't think that you know necessarily that you know. That the that the idea of deicide plays into everyday anti-Semitism today, um, but it certainly does. You know, I remember my mom as a child telling me that she was called a, a Christ killer as a kid. I've been called a Christ killer. Um, does that fuel and and incorporate and and is the this the central reason anti-Semitism exists? No, um, but that certainly was a fueler for many for many generations throughout the Middle Ages. Yeah, no, that's good to hear. I know that there were some Christian groups or groups that professed to be Christian that supported Hitler. And I know that for some Jews today that have some connections back to the Holocaust, the grandparents, great grandparents, so forth, um, there is continued um, triggers. Um, and it was instructive for me to learn that that uh, so, I, I, and I think that as Christians, it's really important for us to continually say that we reject that form or expression of Christianity. I think just to add on to that, though, something that Jews also recognize, um, I'm not familiar with Jewish groups that supported the, the Nazis. I am very familiar and acknowledging and grateful for the Christian groups that rescued Jews during the Holocaust. Yes. And that is something that we are um, internally grateful for. Um, in our Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, Yad Vashem, we, we have a whole you know, memorial to what we call um, the righteous among the, the, the nations. Um, yeah. Those are Christians who, who stepped up and, and saved people. Yeah. Dietrich Bonhoeffer um, was killed because of his position. He was influenced by um, the African-American Christians here in New York and went back with the sort of a view of the faith that was more supported than against um, so the Jews. So, <clears throat> thank you. That's 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 very very insightful. You can say some um, next one. No, that was it, man. It was it's awesome, man. Thank you for yeah. bringing them together, man. That's... Yeah. So, um, how how has the current crisis in the Middle East fanned the flames of anti-Semitism here in the U.S. 
Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's important to recognize what Israel is, um, what October 7th was, and what the intergenerational trauma that has come since. since. Um, Israel exists for the first time um, in 2,000 years as, the, as a Jewish sovereign state. A place where, you know, as, as I was sharing earlier, for generations, Jews have lived in places, have grown comfortable in places, and then seen that host country turn on its Jews and kill them or expel them. And the Holocaust was the ultimate example of this, but it's a long history of, of it happening from country to country to country. And in many ways, Israel is the answer to that, is that once when the Jewish people have their own country with their own army, um, no one can, can kill them the way it's been done in, in history. And October 7th, you had the largest number of Jews killed in one day since the Holocaust. And the worst thing was that it happened when you had an army and you had all the mechanisms that you would expect are supposed to be there to protect you. And so on many, many levels, this idea of Jewish safety all of a sudden just turned, okay? And then maybe the things that we thought were protecting us weren't there. But I think that for Jews in America, um, what surprised us most was the reaction of October 7th. And, and I, when I say October 7th, I mean October 7th. You didn't have to wait a day for there already to be protesting. You didn't have to wait for missiles to be, strike, to be striking in Gaza from the IDF, right? Immediately after October 7th, you saw mass protests in the country in support of, of Gaza, um, including some incredibly horrific anti-Semitic language included in, in, into it. And I think for Jews, I could tell you myself, I, I'm one who my parents and grandparents spoke often of anti-Semitism. They, the, they spoke of the old country, they spoke of the fear you have. And I grew up privileged that for the most part, this has been a golden age for Jews. Um, we have probably never ex existed in a country and, and received as many, um, as much welcome and as much support as we do here in America. Um, and when they would say, oh, you need to be careful, anti-Semitism is a problem, you kind of be like, anti-Semitism is something that exists in a different time, in a different place. It doesn't happen here. Um, and since October 7th, you've seen a lot of Jews do a pause and say, wait a second. What happened before is happening right now. And when we're watching on the television, um, instances, whether it's you're seeing cases of a plane lands in Russia, and there's a, a rumor that Jews are on the plane and a mob attacks the airport trying to find the Jews to kosher restaurants in America who are not anything political. They're a kosher restaurant, they're Jewish, being, um, attack, being um, boycotted, being protested, being uh, their windows smashed. When we're seeing um, individual shop owners put up signs that say, no Jews allowed. Well, wow. um, just this weekend, we, um, you know, I, you're watching videos on TikTok of um, people shouting in a in a subway, like all the Zionists have to get out. Um, and we view that as Zionist is code word for Jew, um, because Does the whole yeah, Jewish almost ninety ninety percent of Jews in America are are um, are Zionist. Um, so I think in many ways we are experiencing a level of fragility that we, that, that we didn't know existed. Um, and there's some of it that's physical violence. We're seeing physical violence against Jews and we're seeing a lot of rhetoric. And then I'll also add at the same time of all of this happening is that you have the media picking up on it. And it's like the number one news story every single night. You can't, you can't open up CNN or Fox News without reading something about the Jews. And I remember like turning to my wife and I was like, when can they stop talking about us? Um, and so I think in many ways, you're, you're just feeling this constant onslaught, this constant criticism, this constant you know, saying that you can't, um, you can't be who you are. Um, you know, we've had situations here on the peninsula in Virginia where Jews have been told they cannot participate in events unless they disavow any feeling they have towards Israel. There's no other ethnic group in the world that would be told, you know, hey, you're a Chinese. The only way we can have a Chinese cultural event is if you somehow say China's bad. 
it doesn't happen. Um, and so I think we're looking at, at, this, at this moment of Jews are being treated in a way that no other group ever, ever is treated. Um, and to be honest, it's scary. Hmm. I'll no, I, I want to go back to something you said. You said Zionism and Judaism is um, sometimes used interchangeably. 90% of the Jews in this country are Zionists. Mm -hmm. Can you explain? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll just say the, the two words are not interchangeable. Okay. So Judaism is the belief in uh, Jewish ideas and values and ultimately the Torah, right? That, that God gave to, gave to Moses. We just celebrated Shavuot yesterday, the giving of the Torah. Um, Zionism is the belief in self-determination that Jews have a right to a state in their ancestral homeland. There's two different ideas, but they're also linked. So Judaism has, has the connection to Eretz Israel, to the land of Israel, intertwined throughout. Um, our Sidor, our prayer book, where we pray from three times a day, includes constant prayers yearning for return to Israel. For 2,000 years since we've been exiled, every Jewish religious person has prayed to ultimately one day return to Israel. Many of our holidays are routed around um, Israel. We just celebrated Shavuot yesterday, which is the harvest holiday. Um, where we celebrate the wheat harvest in Israel. Um, on Passover, which we celebrated a couple months ago, um, we celebrate um, the exodus from Egypt, the leaving, um, um, the freedom from, from Egypt, but at the same time, the journey to Israel. Mm -hmm. And we end our service um, on, on Passover as uh, Lashana Habab Yerushalayim. Next year, may we celebrate in Jerusalem. Um, so all of our, tr many of our traditions and um, and cultural um, celebrations are all linked to the land of Israel. Um, I would even suggest Judaism, which comes from the word Judah. Judah is the, the kingdom of Judah. Um, mm -hmm. Everything about Judaism is linked to Israel. Um, as I shared, you know, close to 90% of Jews say that believing in Israel is an essential part of their Jewish identity. Um, it's, it is linked. Um, you know, I think it's challenging at this moment, especially on, on news media, when you'll, they'll find the one, the one or two Jews who disagree with that, um, that um, say, no, um, there's nothing Jewish about Israel. Um, it's, it's just not, it's not factually true. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, it is not the belief of most Jews in America. That being said, I think because we're having a conversation about anti-Semitism, I think it's important to also realize that criticism of the state of Israel is not anti-Semitic. Um, you um, should be allowed to disagree with Israel. Um, hence, if you go to any cafe in Tel Aviv, you will find lots of Jews criticizing the decisions of the government of Israel. If you sit around my Shabbat table, we will spend our time criticizing the government of Israel. Um, where it draws a distinction in our minds is when you hold Israel to a double standard that you wouldn't hold any other country to. When you put Israel on a pedestal and say that no, it does not have the right to defend itself, um, and that you are criticizing actions that you don't criticize other countries for, um, I think that's where we as Jews, we raise our eyebrows and say, well, what's going on here? Um, What's happening in Gaza is horrific. It is unconscionable, the loss of life that is happening to Palestinians living in Gaza. Um, the outrage that is happening in America in the streets has not happened for other atrocities. 500,000 Syrians died in, um, died in Syria. We didn't see people on the streets protesting um, in, the, in the level that they are today. And as Jews, the way we interpret this is, is that it's because it's a Jewish state. Because the only Jewish state in the world is doing this act, it is being criticized. Um, and it's alarming for us. Now, how should uh, non-Jews be allies in the fight against anti-Semitism, or is there a place for non-Jews to be uh, to come alongside to address this issue, what does that look like? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question. So I, I'm just going to give a story, and and, I, and it, again, the question is about anti-Semitism, but I, you know, I believe that everyone has a role to play in fighting hate, whether it's anti-Semitism or Islamophobia or anti-Palestinianism or racism. 
everyone has a responsibility to fight hate. Um, and I'm gonna share a story um, that I found very impactful by this man um, named Corey Fleischer, who lives up in Canada. Uh, he worked as a um, power washer. And he one day was driving to work with all of his power washing equipment in his truck, and he passed a swastika on the road, and he kind of just like drove by it. And all day it was bugging him because he had every tool he needed in his the back of his truck to erase that hate. And for some reason, there was something stopping him, something that was just like, this isn't my problem. This is someone else's problem. And it bugged him all day. So he got off work and he immediately drove back home and um, stopped at that swastika and erased it. And ever since, he hasn't been stopping, stopping the erasure of hate. I think that every person has that same like pickup truck that with the power washer in the back, that they have the tools at their disposal that they can use to fight hate. I think that um, people need to feel empowered, like they can do something. I think also there is a tendency to dismiss anti-Semitism, that anti-Semitism isn't real. It isn't, um, it isn't as bad as you make it out to be. I think what people need to do is recognize that when, when, when Jews are saying there's something wrong, like, listen to us. I, I can't tell you, so part of my work with the United Jewish community is that we're kind of the first call whenever there's an anti-Semitic incident on the peninsula. And I have countless conversations with school principals and teachers and, and different, um, different civic leaders. And there's always a tendency to downplay it. Um, there was a, a situation I was dealing with recently where a swastika was being drawn on a Jewish student's desk at school. It took, and it was only one swastika on this one Jewish student's desk. It happened in, a, in a, one of our cities that have very few Jews. <laughs> this might have been the only Jewish student. Um, the first time it happened, well, how do they know it was, how do they know it was, because he's Jewish? Maybe they're just drawing swastikas around, which I would argue, like, well, that's also a problem. Then it happened a second time. It took three times before the school recognized that, oh, wait a second, maybe there is a linkage between this being a Jewish student and hate happening. So I think the first thing is, the most important thing is like, don't dismiss it. Like anti-Semitism is real. It affects real people. It keeps us up at night. Um, I am a, um, a father of three children. Um, I have two boys. Um, we, uh, we wear kippahs on our head with little head coverings. We can't hide that we're Jewish, right? It terrifies me that my kids we walk around and what's, what is going to happen to them. Um, many Jews are, are making the decision to hide their symbols. Um, this is kind of the model that we saw years and years ago in France and England, which had an anti-Semitism problem much, much earlier, where you know, if, if I went to France, I would wear a baseball hat because uh, it's, it's that unsafe. In America, you're starting to get these feelings where Jews are questioning whether they wear a kippah on their head. Um, most, most notably on college campuses, um, there's been a big um, question of, do you wear your Hillel shirt? Hillel is the Jewish club on campus. I was recently talking with some students, like they, they don't even feel like they can say the word Hillel in public of fear of what might happen to them, what, what would be, what's gonna be said to them. And I guess I, I, I went off track a little bit here, but my point is, is that anti-Semitism is real and it's happening. And the number one thing is to listen. Um, I think that you should never, if someone's saying there's a problem, say, oh, no, it's not. It's in your head. Yeah. Um, I, I, you're absolutely spot on with that. Um, you know, as an African-American, we live this every day. Um, my ex-wife was a, was a teacher at the time, and um, she's um, mixed Hispanic. And so she was headed to work one day, and she apparently accidentally cut off a guy and he um, rolled his window down and gave her the middle finger and said, you effing N-word. And she had never been called that all of her life. And uh, she cried all day. That kind of, those types of stories happen all the time, all the time. Um, sort of microaggressions. Um, uh, so I know that the feeling of living uh, always aware of who you are 
uh, is why sometimes we say black church. I mean, why can't just be church? Because <laughs> there's something particular about it being black that makes it what it is um, over against a world that is against it, uh, being against blackness. Uh, so I can I can relate to that. Um, you got something to say about that? Well, this is good for me because, and I know we need to get to um, Ms. Majda, but I this is good for me because my interpretation until because when someone's going through something, I respect it because a lot of times people still don't believe black people get shot by the police when you still see them on TV getting shot by the police with their hands up and no weapons. And you wonder how can this white person go out here and kill 20 people and get arrested alive and a gentleman who hadn't even committed a crime, you know, is is dead. And so, and a lot of times when you say certain things, uh, some of the people in different cultures say it doesn't happen. And my thing is the same thing you just said, when you say if a Jew person tell you this happens, you know, if a Palestinian tell you this happens, if a black person tell you it happens, it happens. Because if you respect that person and you you feel like you respect their their personality, you respect their character, when we say it happening, it's, it's happening. So to hear this is 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 because black comedians, preachers, a lot of us, they'll say, man, don't say nothing about Jews. Because, I mean, not even if it's a joke. Like, I'm talking about when you joking because you joke about cultures when you a comedian. I'm just going to stick with the comedian piece right now. You know, a lot of times, you know, if you hear Dave Chappelle or you hear Chris Rock, they be like, I don't know if I need to say this because, you know, if you say no, about black people, uh, Palestinian people, white people, a lot of people scared of, to talk about Jews because they feel like that's when they'll get canceled, even though it's a joke. So to hear you say that is 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 education for me because I knew you all, you know, I know you all go through things like we go through things. I know the Palestinians go through things as, as we go through things. But to hear your perspective is 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 definitely new to me and I'm definitely learning something <laughs> on in, in this episode right now because I would think that I would always hear like with Jamal and other preachers that kind of say we need to help both sides, help the Jews and the Palestinians. You hear a lot of people cr criticize them to say, no, the Jew, Israel is a chosen nation, so why are you siding with the Palestinians at all? And they say, no, we're not siding with anyone. We don't want to deal with hate. We don't want to deal with unnecessary onslaught. We we, we don't want to see Palestinians killing Jews or Jews killing Palestinians or anyone killing anyone. But a lot of times when you say it out loud, if you're on the side of or if you're saying something to defend um, the Palestinians, a lot of times you get more flack for that. So to hear that from you is, is not a great thing to hear, but to, to hear your pain and you go through it is enlightening for me because I really didn't know that you all went through that. I feel like a white person, when they say they don't know, we going through something. <laughs> but at least, at least I can admit that I don't know. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I didn't know, so I definitely, you know, I apologize for my my ignorance as far as, you know, I didn't say anything like, oh, I hate Jews or anything wrong, but in my mind, just my thought patterns, I would think that the Palestinians was going through more because people always call you all the chosen people, you know, going by the Bible or whatnot. And anytime I heard anybody say anything to, to side with the Palestinians, I always heard more hate than if someone says something on the side of the Jews. So I'm, I'm just glad you enlightening me and educating me. So thank you for so being I, I think that there's like, you know, I think there's elements in, um, again, I'm not the expert on Christianity. You guys, you guys certainly are. I think that there are differences in the way that Christian denominations approach Jews. Um, I'm not so talking I think, about people, period. People, period. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, you know, I, so, so I think that in general, though, at, at the, the, the base of what you said, I think in general, I think we need to see more embracing of like humanity and the humans yes. of people, right? Like hate anywhere is horrible. It needs to be uprooted. It doesn't matter if it's against Jews or if it's against Palestinians or if it's against African Americans or if it's against Muslims yes. or, you know, fill in the fill in the name. Yes. Um, we need to be taking a stand, it, and it doesn't matter on a conflict. And at, at the end of the day, there's you know a conflict happening thousands of miles away that is horrible and um, terrible, and ultimately will end um, in peace soon with the return of hostages. Um, however, hold on. 
do you really think the peace wants the hostages? What happens then? Like this, this. Do, do I, do I, do I think, think or do I yearn? Not yearn, but like not just the hostages. Like yeah. we can't go back to before yeah. October 7th either. Yeah. Like we cannot go back. And I think maybe that's, I'm sorry. No, sorry no, 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 we need a dialogue. No, that, that, yeah, I think yeah, that, that is, listen, I was on a flight to Jerusalem when October 7th yeah. happened. It, it, it was hor horrific. Uh, and I'm really sorry. Yeah. But, and, and there should not be a but. I wish we could just stand here and, and mourn with you and grieve with you. So um, I don't want to invalidate the trauma. Um, I, I believe it's, it's just traumatic what happened. But for a, from a Palestinian perspective, um, history didn't start October 7th. The, the violence and the, the no peace um, we didn't have peace before October 7th. There, there was violence before October 7th in the, the, in the West Bank. Um, the set settlers and things that were happening. We have a very far right government right now. Um, I am, I'm from Jerusalem. Uh, and, and so I saw the violence differently. But, but you know, since 48, Palestinians have not had peace. Um, and that is something that we cannot ignore in this discussion either. If we are going to have peace, then let's have peace. And we have to talk about Israel um, as it is created today as a, you know, I, I understand the Jewish people want to have a safe place. I understand that. I understand the, the, that thought process after the Holocaust. But as a Palestinian, um, many feel that that came on the back of Palestinians. Um, I didn't immigrate to Jerusalem. I was born there and so were my parents and so were their parents. I have roots there. Um, you have Jewish roots there, um, but I'm from there, and I, I um, we have to address that part. There will be no peace unless we talk about how do we live in that small piece of land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. How do we? Um, how does an ethno state exist? Because that's what it is. Israel is a Jewish state. It's an ethno state. Mm -hmm. How how can we have conversations about how does that exist and ensure that people there, whether they are Palestinian citizens of Israel, whether they are East Jerusalem Palestinian residents uh, who live within Israeli territory and cannot even vote, how do West Bank Palestinians uh, have, you know, get to live there and have equality and have um, freedoms? And how do Gaza residents who are Palestinian uh, live there? Until we have that discussion, um, I, I'm so happy and I pray for the day that the hostages come back home. Um, and I pray also for the, you know, over 4,000, 5,000 Palestinians in Israeli detention centers who have not been uh, charged with a crime. They have no access to lawyers um, who've had to deal with that even before October 7th. Um, I guess the point is like, unless we talk about the roots causes and until we, 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 deal with the real elephant in the room, there will be no peace. We will continually have cycles of violence. Um, and, and in summary, um, for me, history didn't stay, start October 7th. There was never any peace to begin with. Can I ask you a question? Because mm -hmm. you said something about the no voting peace. When I went to Israel to do a tour with Dr. Guns, I had, we had a Palestinian um, guide, a Muslim, and we had a Christian guide on another bus. And so I was I was on the Palestinian bus first. Anyway, long story short, he was telling me, and I want to know if this was true because I've said it before, he was saying that in, in Israel where we were, that the Jews had one type of license plate and you all had another type of license it plate. It depends on where, like... And the, if you're in the West he, Bank, you would have a different yeah, He was like, saying that they couldn't drive in certain places. Yeah. You couldn't drive in certain places if you were Palestinian with a certain license plate. But if you were Jewish, you could go everywhere. Like, how, how true is that? Because, you know, he, he was Palestinians like, are fragmented. So we uh -huh. have the state of Israel and then you have the West Bank uh -huh. um, and then you have the Gaza Strip. And those were the places that you were supposed to have at, when, after Oslo. That was going to become the Palestinian state. Um, but that never happened. And over time, the West Bank has been taken over more and more right. by Israel. We have a lot of Israeli settlers there. So about 80% right now is under Israeli military control. So when, when he was talking about that, he was talking about Palestinians living in the West Bank. Um, they have some 
um, rights to governance that set themselves under the Palestinian Authority. Uh, but the, the big picture is uh, they are under the, the Israeli military rule. So whatever comes in, whatever comes out, uh, the Israeli military controls, whatever the population registry is controlled by Israel, uh, uh, movement uh, is also controlled by Israel. And, and over the years, there have been a lot more settlements um, built there. And those are Israeli Jews who live there. Um, and so they, they yes, build roads um, for security purposes, they would say, you know, where they can drive and Palestinians can drive. But that is the, the West Bank. Um, mm. But then you'll have the East Jerusalem residents. Uh, they are Palestinians and they pay taxes. They, they, are, they live in, in Jerusalem. They work with Jewish people. Um, they have a lot more benefits and um, freedoms than let's say a Palestinian in the West Bank and definitely more freedoms than a Palestinian in Gaza, but they cannot vote in the government. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of inequality there. Yeah, and um, that, that gets into a different conversation, the focus. Uh, how do you see, Maja, um, the anti-Palestinian hate sort of reverberating here in this country? Um, hate in the past, in, like the, the way we experience hate here mm -hmm. comes in different forms. Okay. You have hate uh, in re rhetoric, the language, the labeling that is used when talking about Palestinians. Um, you, yeah, I, I, would, I would love yeah. to give, yeah, I would yeah, love to give, yeah. and actually, yeah. probably just, I, so I don't misspeak. I don't, <laughs> don't want to get sued. So you have somebody like Marjorie uh, Taylor Greene. Okay. And in terms of labeling, she equates anyone in solidarity with Palestine with being for Hamas. Uh, you have Eric Bowling, a host at Newsmask, Mas Newsmax. He said Palestinians are addicted to violence like an addict is addicted to drugs. In, in this man's opinion, um, we're never victims. We're always an aggressive people. Um, you have da Dan Gaynor. Uh, he's a freelance opinion editor at Fox News, and he called Palestinians and Arabs barbarian pigs. We're dirty animals. Um, he said down the news? Yes. Wow. You have Charles Kirk, the president of Turning Point USA, which is a Christian organization. Uh, he said last week that a vast majority of Muslims don't hold Western values, but rather have a medieval worldview. He also re referred to Representative Ilhan Omar, who happens to be Muslim, as an active threat uh, to the United States who hates this country. And it's this, this language, um, it's used to create this perception in America about Palestinians and about Muslims. But the problem is it doesn't even stop there because it becomes violent. Mm -hmm. um, after October 7th, there was a seven-year-old boy in Illinois who's Palestinian, stabbed to death 26 times by his, mm -hmm. seven years old, wow. 26 times stabbed by his landlord, who in the police reports um, admitted that he was um, enraged because of you know, news coverage. Um, you had three Palestinian boys in Vermont who were taking a walk after Thanksgiving din dinner. One of them was visibly Palestinian. He was wearing a kafia. Um, they were shot. One of them is uh, paralyzed today. Um, but you also have protesters, you know, marching in Austin, Texas, who were taking marching and uh, for a ceasefire. And it was a peaceful uh, protest. And my friend was there. And a man was walking back to his car after the protest, and he was stabbed. So language translates to violence. Um, but we fight. So it also creates this environment of being really, you know, I thought twice about coming on the podcast. I don't want to put a target on my family. I don't, um, I don't want to be labeled. Uh, so I'm afraid to, you know, to speak and talk about my experiences because I don't want to be labeled. Um, and I'm, I'm also, I, was, I thought twice, it took me months before I put a small Palestinian flag in my front yard. Um, I was really afraid of what my neighbors would think. I was afraid of um, losing my job or, or, you know, I'm a freelancer, so job opportunities. Am I really afraid that my husband would lose his job? Um, because we hear of the stories uh, in, our, in our community about people who have lost their jobs. Um, another form of hate is doxing. You have well-funded organizations like the Canary Mission, uh, and that, that organization has existed for years, and it targets mostly Palestinians who are very critical of Israel, who might be involved with the BDS movement, who might be organizing in college campuses uh, to create Palestinian chapters, um, who want to see a change in our... Um, foreign policy in the U.S. towards Palestinians. Um, and yes, some of them are anti-Semitic. 
uh, there's no question. Some of them are anti-Semitic, and the, the, the language they use is not acceptable. Uh, but that it, it, it could be somebody who's organizing to make a change for the community, and it could be somebody who's literally anti-Semitic. You end up on that list with a picture of your face, like um, they take a picture of your face from social media with all your identifying information, and it leads to blacklisting in, uh, in, the job, in jobs. Um, we have a young man from our community, he interned in uh, New York um, at a big corporation there. And he was doing really well until October 7th. He thought he was going to get a job. Uh, he didn't get it. And he asked why. And when they, they told him it was because of the symbolism that he used on his social media. The only symbolism he used was a Palestinian flag that you put under your name. Um, my own mother has called me to tell me, please remove it. Because she's a, she is afraid of what would that do for, for my job prospects and for my husband's job pro mm. prospects. So doxing is very real. But so is also academic... Um, censorship. Uh, recently, there was even a report on uh, uh, Columbia University. The board of directors chose to shut down the website because editors re refused to remove um, a journal written by a Palestinian human rights lawyer who wrote about the Nakba as a, um, as a legal concept. And the Nakba is the catastrophe, for us, the catastrophe. Uh, it's when Israel was created. For us, it's considered a, a great catastrophe because of our experiences. Um, they try to shut that down, and it took the media outrage uh, to put that back up. This young man was also um, in Harvard. He wasn't allowed to publish it either. Um, but there's also, you know, fear of it getting sued. And uh, there's a lot of funding uh, and organizations that are suing nonprofits that are pro-Palestinians. Um, they, they're going after them with claims that some of these uh, organizers at, at the college campuses are the Hamas wing of uh, the foreign Hamas wing, you know, propaganda wing of Hamas. Um, they're very loose accusations. They probably will not hold in court. Uh, they will not win. But that's never really the goal. The goal is to intimidate. It's the goal is to make us use our very limited resources to defend ourselves, to ruin, destroy our reputation. I, I, haven't, I haven't donated to any cause when it comes to back home because I'm afraid that one day it will come back to bite me and I will be labeled a pro-Hamas supporter. And I am absolutely not a pro Hamas supporter. So, 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 so um, thanks for that. I, I think it's important that we understand the language, right? Mm -hmm. um, what is Hamas and what are Palestinians? And you mentioned Muslims. And it's like, are they all the same? Or are they, like, you know, Hamas, Muslims, Palestinians? If Palestinians, you can be a Palestinian um, Muslim, you can be a Palestinian Christian. And Christians there are uh, from various. Um, kind of like ethnic backgrounds. Mm -hmm. You could be a Samaritan. In Nablus, we have the Samaritans. Mm -hmm. It's a small community, but they still exist. Mm -hmm. It would be great if you guys visit, uh, so, go there. But, but, but just so to that's the Palestinian the people. Yeah. Um, and then Hamas is, um, Hamas was really after this, it, it, it really grew more. And I'm, again, I'm not an expert on, um, on I'm an expert on my experience mm -hmm. and, and, Things that I have read, but I, you know, there are people who are just a lot smarter. They can tell you this. Which is Palestinian and Hamas are not the same. No, it is. It's it's, it's part it of. It is the same. Not the same. Palestinian okay. are the people. Okay. And and and, you, and just like have you have, you have, and within that people, there are different people who are fighting for freedom, uh, or they're actually Hamas is complicated. It's a political mm -hmm. party, and within that political party, there's also the um, militant. Uh, Islamic grade or something. Mm -hmm. I'm not an expert on this. Yeah, so, I just uh, the only thing is I just wanted to be clear that Palestinian, from your perspective, is not one in the same. No, because you can be Palestinian. Yeah, I'm not. I'm Palestinian. I'm not. Ham I'm not a Hamas member. Yeah. I'm not a re like a Republican member or a Democrat member. You know, oh, yeah. or and I'm not a KKK. You know, right, I could, right. I'm just American. So it's the no, same thing. It's I'm like American. White people in KKK is the same. Exactly. Okay. It's not. And I but, think that's the okay. problem here. Yeah. Uh, that is this this. On purpose, it's 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 done to label pa all like all Palestinians are Hamas, and that's absolutely not true. Yeah. Um, in fact, there's no like Hamas was suppressed in the West Bank. The the they are the ar they're the enemies of Fatah, which is another political arm, uh, entity. Mm -hmm. So um, they so, had lost a lot of support actually in Gaza too. Um, mm -hmm. So 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 in 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 terms of the way the experience here in the country of hate. It, you're, the way I understood you is that people assume that because one is Palestinian, 
one is all support of Hamas. They're not. That, they, they don't assume. They are being told. Oh, they've been told. They, they are being research. told. It is labeling. And see, yeah. the thing about it, what I learned, um, Eugene, well, you know, when I interviewed that Republican guy that kept, anyway, well, you know how you and I always talk about, <laughs> um, man, what we talking about, man? When they talk about black history, they were calling it, what What was it we were talking about? When they, they were trying to lump black history into this. Um, black Panther? No. You know how they use, they weaponize, anyway, not black history, but Oh man, when we kept saying it was a study, man. When oh, we, oh, critical race theory. Critical race theory. Oh, okay. So yeah. we talked about critical race theory. Oh. The Republican, he actually thought he was like, no, critical race theory. That's black history. I said it's not. And then when we talked about it, just like he just educated me right now about what they go through, and she's educating people. What <laughs> I had to let him know that critical racism was a theory, and it's not black history. And so. He got quiet, and when I started talking about him, and we we we, and he understood. I knew what I was talking about. He was like, "Wow, they weaponize it, right? They the people that bring it up. I think they already know the true answers, but they get those individuals who just listen to every word that come out of their mouth because they look up to them, and they just put out certain rhetoric, like you're saying, to weaponize it, to 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 make the Jews hate the Palestinians, the Palestinians hate the Jews, because so many people, when you look at racism." it definitely benefits the top 2% people that make all the money. I mean, when you look at racism, if we really was to come together and the middle class and the people who weren't controlling a lot of economics to come together, why are we not making stop signs? Why are we not making um, uh, the, the, the mattresses and things of that nature? They use all that stuff in jails, you understand? And, it's, and if, if the people were to come together and we be, begin to see how much control uh, the upper echelon has because to keep people separate is power. And the, to, to, to keep people separate is power for certain people. And what irritates me about our society is we always say, oh, wow, we got something in common. We, we, we both went over to Oxford over the summer. Oh, me and him had something in common. We both have on dress shoes. And people always try to bring the commonalities we, we we need to really start learning how to how to how to celebrate our differences because our differences are what makes us powerful because if you could do the same thing I could do then what's the point in me what benefit do I have from you and what benefit do you have from me and I'm I'm saying it to say this I when you said you were scared to come on here I was wondering and by by we we didn't we only in the middle <laughs> because we the host. <laughs> we don't have them on the side because we think they're going to fight each other. Let me go ahead and get that elephant out the room. They're not, we don't think they're going to fight each other. We just are together because we hosted and they want in the, and our cameraman want us in the middle. So, but to, to, for you both to come on here is a testament to your character and your boldness because I'm sure some people are going to be mad. Wow, why were you on the show with a Palestinian? Some of your people are going to be like, why are you on the show with a Jew? And to come together and try to discuss and get down to the bottom of this is just bold. And I know I, I was going to wait to the end of the show to say this, but once you said that, it triggered me because this is a bold move you have to sit up here and say, I want to talk about the issues because when you want to talk about the issues of why you're going through and why you feel like the history didn't start October in October, it started years ago when you all felt like you were being pushed out of your own land. And for you to say, if you don't like the atrocities that's going on in Gaza, but I, and I'm sure some of your people are going to be upset because some people are so extreme. So I just got to just say thanks to my host. I know we're in the middle of this show. For him to bring, for you to bring a Palestinian and a Jew together is is a flipping phenomenal thing. Because well, see, I'm learning so much, and I know you you kind of, you, I know you really being careful. You got all this stuff written down because you don't want to say that in wrong. No, but no. it's just such a power. This powerful to me. I'm learning so much from both sides. But here's the thing, this should be ordinary. We live in a country where we right. all belong, and but, if people but don't it's, feel it's, like they belong but it's in not this ordinary. world. And uh, we can't fix all of the challenges, but we can listen to people's stories about how they experience trauma. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's, I mean, I mean, you, we black, right? <laughs> you know you what can't hide, like, right? Whether I put something on my head or not, you see me. 
You know what I'm saying? It, I, when I see a police officer behind me, I'm scared every single brother, time. Even though I, I bring the police together, even though I'm a volunteer police chaplain, I know that I'm black, and it's a it's it's a chance that some cop is going to think I'm a criminal because of the rhetoric they put out. So the same, which is what you're saying, right? Rhetoric. But you've yes. been the rhetoric that you've been. Yes. Put, that's exactly the experience that we have, yes. which is why I don't see this as phenomenal as it is just real. It's like yes. people allowed to, you know. Um, and I always wondered kind of what do other people experience um, that will make them feel oppressed as if they don't belong. So to hear these stories, it connects with a part of me that's deeper than I can express. I was um, yesterday, Shavuot, I saw Jews walking and I thought to myself, how many of them are self-conscious that they have the kippah on? And for you to sit here and say that, it just spoke to what I was thinking yesterday. Same thing when I see Palestinians want to celebrate their flag. I'm like, they are celebrating um, their native country. Um, but but what, does, what does celebrating their identity mean to other people when they look at it and make them feel oppressed in their own identity? And it's the same thing when it comes to, you know, African-Americans. For a long time, I wouldn't wear Africa around my neck. I wouldn't, wouldn't associate with the, with the nation for fear that people are going to think, oh, he's a radical black person and he's trying to make some political statement. So I couldn't even, and I went to Ghana and it changed my life. And uh, I came back and I said, I want to be fully who I am, you know. So for you to say that, I think it's a problem in a country that claimed to be the home of the free, land of the free, home of the brave, how we are stirring the pot of division to the point where people have to go into silos to feel safe. Yes. Um, and that's how we got black church. They're afraid to go in the white church because they're afraid, Man, this is, you know, that's, that's how we, you know, it's the same. So there's a part of this conversation that, that makes me feel like I belong here. Yes, cause it's a it's it's like I never knew that a Jew, a Jew or some Jewish people felt oppressed. Like, like I'm scared to express myself and wear my symbolism. You understand? I understood the Palestinians for what goes on, but I didn't understand it. So to hear you and to hear you, and then to me, whenever you talk about black love. And whenever you talk about, when we talked about critical race theory, when we said it wasn't a black history, it was a theory, you two put a violent banner on there. Yeah. Like, like we had talked about something violent. We just educated them on what the critical race theory really was. And because Republicans weaponize it so much and people weaponize it so much and don't really want to hear the truth of what it is, they put a, 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 an explicit, be careful. We don't curse on here. Well, most of the time. Well, <laughs> We, we he edited it out. <laughs> no, he don't. So, it, 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 we, we, we don't. We don't do. We, well, we definitely don't promote violence. So to have that explicit, be careful. You need to be seventeen or older to listen to this. When we just talked about the critical race theory. Yeah. So I understand what you go through. Understand what you go through because everyone says they want. We supposed to be the melting pot, but are we really the melting pot or are we the separate pot? Because. No one really wants you to embrace your culture, to me, sometimes, unless it's just uh, white and, America. And, and America I mean, was started on people who were outcasts from their other countries. It, it ain't like they were the, the elite individuals who everybody wanted to be there. They were the people that the king didn't want in the country anyway. But yet when other people uh, uh, migrate here, immigrate, uh, 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 migrate here and become immigrants or whatnot, then you want to down them because you feel like they should have stayed where they were. Well, you didn't. Right. I don't, I don't understand. But anyway, I do feel like, I feel good, man. <laughs> I, feel, I feel accepted right now. You, yeah. know, you don't feel that yeah. all the time. So. Well, I think that it's a shame in 2025 or 2024 that, you know, we are regressing in many ways. And um, there is no denying that we feel connected to our stories in different ways. But we have got to come to a place where people in this country should not feel threatened for being in their own skin and believing their own um, ethnic or religious identity. Um, that's not what religious freedom is about, right? Right. It shouldn't be like that. And 
and for a group of people to be labeled in the ways that you've said it, the news, the news does this. The news has a way of framing things and make it and, and sort of um, creating the cesspool of hate. In so, many so there's the church. And, and the church. and the church. And the church. You know, I wanted to go back. Glad you said that. And I want to hear more about what you mean by that. While you, while you think about it, let me just respond to this side of, okay. of to um, the Jewish community. The reason I ask you, in what way does the um, Christianity continue to support anti-Semitism? And you were very gracious. I have been increasingly encouraging students in Christian ministry formation. Sometimes when preachers preach, we say we refer to groups that may have been um, um, Jesus's interlocutors in ways that sound like a whole group of Jews. Like instead of saying the Pharisees or the Essens or his interlocutors, I've heard preachers just refer to the Jews. They don't really mean it the way it sounds, but it, but most of it, ones, it communicates. Most of those are the ones that don't really read their Bible, so they don't really be knowing the Pharisees <laughs> and Sadducees <laughs> and the Sanhedrin. They don't, they don't understand all that. So yeah, go ahead. But you're but, right. That's but what they my do. point it's is, everybody in the same but, but, but my point is that those subtle ways contribute to yes, the big, big problem that we have. If language matters, it does. how we, how we refer, how do we, how we, that's why I said Hamas and Palestinian, because language matters. You know, I don't want to try to say American, oh, he's a Republican because he's American. I, I, I am not. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I knew you, yeah. <laughs> no, he might be, but I'm not, but I'm just saying. <laughs> see how so, the you, see, you see how he's coming at me with language, see? <laughs> he can do it to his own people. Man. I know. I, I my my point is, my Eric. point, I digress. But, and there's nothing wrong with being if one is. I'm just saying that the two are Democrat and American. Don't, they're not the same. So there are nuances there, right? There are, there are particularities there that I don't think we give the benefit of other people, right? And the meaningfulness of one's tradition and their history and what formed them is part of who they are. And sometimes that's held in tension, right? Sometimes it's held in tension. And I think that we have to get become a more sophisticated society where we can hold that intention and and maintain the unity and the love and have the conversations that um, that are necessary for clarity. So thank you. Were you gonna say something about how Christians No, now, you're, you're a Christian, Christian mm -hmm. right? Yeah, Christian Palestinian. Christian Palestinian. Okay. So how do Christian Palestinian Christian? I'm just asking. Oh, we can. Who cares? Okay, really, right? <laughs> he said language matters. Here's the thing: the church doesn't even most most of the church doesn't eat the to churches in the Western world doesn't realize that there is such a thing as a Palestinian Christian. They don't realize that there are Christians in Gaza, that there's churches in Gaza, and that there's mm -hmm. schools in Gaza that are Christian run. Um, so. You want me to answer that? Well, because you they know? think Christianity started here. That's why they that, that, that is the, yeah. Plug no, Christianity right started quick. in the <laughs> Middle East by <laughs> a Jewish man. Yeah. Uh, you know, so we cannot sit, you know, there, there's this thing that go around. They talk about, you know, Jesus was um, Palestinian. That's just, it's foolish talk. Okay. It's just, a, it's just a thing to say, but, but it is. The Christianity was born in the Middle East, in that piece of land. And since the day it was born, there have been Christians there. And, um, Palestinian Christians are some of the earliest Christians, and they've held a presence there, and they've been go they've gone through various different, um, you say, occupations, um, but they're still there. Uh, so that's something that we cannot forget. Um, to be Palestinian Christian, um, it's to be discredited, it's to be silenced, um, it's it's to In be ignored. Country. Yes, sir. Okay. It's to be ignored. Um, you know, I, I go to church and it's either complete silence or it's complete uh, support, a very vocal, loud support for Israel. Um, it's, it's to listen to rhetoric. And, and what's hardest in the Christian world here is that they use scripture. Uh, they either are going to use scripture to um, demonize. The latest trend in the, uh, in today here is it's to talk about the Amalekites and compare the story of the Old Testament to what is going on now. Um, the Amalekites, if, if people don't know this, the Amalekites are in the Old Testament. They are the enemies of Israel. And God tells Saul, go out and kill them all. Kill the, the men, can kill the women, kill the children, kill the livestock. Don't leave anything behind. Um, and so when you have 
the Christian church used that in their language and, and it's in newsletters um, sent to all their followers. Um, what you are doing is giving divine um, sanction on the state, the modern state of Israel to do as it pleases. Um, it's not loving to the Palestinians. It's also not loving to, to the people of Israel uh, today. Um, it's I would add to that yeah. that I think there's some Israeli leaders who have also used that Amalekite language, and it is also one of the most uh, grievous um, examples of, of using text uh, for this moment. Yeah. Um, and there, it was used ill wisely, and it needs to be immediately, in my opinion, stopped. Um, but so you use that to use genocidal uh, language, and we just talked about it. This is not the first time in Western Christianity that we use scripture to um, to promote the, the destruction of another people, or at least the harm. They did it to the Jewish people in, in Europe. They did it over and over again, actually. Uh, they did it to the Native Americans here. The, the Puritans used that kind of language. They use it to, to subjugate the black people in America. They use scripture to do this. So one asks, does the Western church ever learn its lesson um, of using language to dehumanize other people? That is my number one question. Um, but it's also, the, un unfortunately, it's using scripture to manipulate. And it's something I myself have to work through and to unlearn. It's, it's this using this Old Testament again of, um, I will bless those who bless you. I will um, curse those who curse you. And they take the you and they put it again into this secular modern state of Israel. And so you have this fear. And I had it for years as a Christian. Um, because of, I was actually highly influenced by uh, Zionist theology. Mm -hmm. um, I was afraid. There, there were things in my soul that I knew was wrong, things that I experienced. I was raised in Jerusalem. And, and you're afraid to criticize the state. You, you're afraid to say this is wrong. You're afraid to say, but I belong here too. And what about me? Um, because of this fear that God is going to somehow come down and judge me and take away all of his blessings because I criticize the state of Israel. Um, that's also how, how many, like, that's why so we have so many Christians today in America that are silent because they're being taught that um, you have to bless those who bless Israel, and if you don't, you will be cursed. We literally used, uh, there was a senator in a hearing uh, recently who used that, the same verse when he was grilling, a, I think, but he thinks she was a Columbia University uh, dean. He, he literally used this verse. So using scripture to to push a certain narrative um, or to, to stop people from talking about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, to, uh, it's just very difficult as a Palestinian Christian to walk into this church and to, and to worship with someone like that. I, I have a Palestinian uh, member of my community. He's, he's Gazan, he's Christian. His entire family lives there. His father passed away in um, the Catholic church that he was seeking shelter in. He didn't have access to medicine. He had health issues. Uh, so he passed away because because of lack of access. His his sister and his mom made a difficult decision to flee to Egypt. And the route that you have to take is very difficult. She collapsed. She's 18 years old, collapsed and died. How do you think he feels living here in the States, here in Virginia, to walk into a church where his people have been compared to the Amalekites? Um, we have language by, by um, the ICEJ, uh, Israel Mission the Israeli uh, Christian embassy that's based out of Israel, but has um, representation all over the world. The, the language that was used was Palestinians have a bloodlust for the Jewish people and nation. Never ever talking about the, like the, the, the and I, I don't have a bloodlust. I, I really do not. I'm Palestinian. I don't, I don't want any more blood spilled. But what about our, our story and our narrative? Um, why, why don't you ever talk about why we are where we are? Why don't you ever give Palestinian Christians a platform to talk about our experiences as a Palestinian Christian? Um, we're only given a platform when, we, when, when they want us to, in, in Christian circles, when they want us to talk about Islam, uh, to talk about, uh, you know, I'm actually originally Muslim. Uh, I'm one of those few who, you know, converted. There are plenty who never converted. They are literally... Um, Christians from thousands of years, but I'm one of the few who's converted from Islam. Um, they only want to give me a platform if I'm going to talk about Islam. Uh, and to break it down in American language, they want me to be the Candace Owens 
of the black community. <laughs> you know, Whoa, they only want us. Shots fired. No such shots fired. <laughs> yeah, Listen, well, there are no, there are conversations. <laughs> there, there are conversations that need to be had about Palestinian society. There are. Yeah. Uh, there are conversations to be had about Hamas and their use of violence. You know, we, we should ha be having these conversations. But in the Christian community, that's all you want me to talk about. You never want me to talk about my experience or my, my friend's experience in the West Bank or Gaza living under Israeli military rule. That's the big no. Um, I've walked into churches and when I've introduced myself and said I'm from Palestine, and I stopped after that, I start using neutral terms like Jerusalem. I was told to my face, there's no such thing as Palestine. There's no such thing as Palestinian. And then I was told about, you know, this, um, they were amazed because they visited Israel and it was this barren land that, you know, Israel has done so much to, to get it to where it is today. And they have. It's, it's, you know, Israel today, as we know it, they've done a lot in that land. But it certainly was never, ever barren. They were a people group that lived there. But you know what? <clears throat> when I went on the tour to Israel, the only reason they let us go to Palestine is because guns took us in when guns went over uh, there. Gun, yeah, the Reverend, Reverend guns. guns. Yeah. 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 Let's, Let's be, be clear, clear about what you're yeah. yeah. throwing yeah. this so, language of guns around. Bishop, <laughs> well, guns. <laughs> Reverend Jeffrey Guns. Well, we went, yeah, I got you. <laughs> we went over there with Jeffrey Guns. Uh, Education Opportunity is this a, it's an organization there that gives you these tours. The only way, reason we even go to Jacob's Well and other places in, Pal in, in Palestine is because uh, uh, Bishop Guns has so much pull with them and favor with them because um, they um, because he pretty much single handedly kept them in business when it was some war times going on before he still was taking trips over there and so they kept the business going and so a lot of them don't understand uh, what's in Palestine or what's over there because. They most of the tours won't take them into Palestine because they feel that it's too dangerous. So a lot of times when people speak, they speak and thinking they speaking from an educated place, but they're actually speaking from ignorance because they really didn't have the experience of it. They only go about what they hear from other people and don't read and research, you know, on on their own. So I definitely under can 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 understand what your frustration with with that. Um. I would, to add to that, I think because the, after the Holocaust, um, the Christian Zionism as a theology permeates American, uh, the American churches, whether they know it or not. Yeah. Um, and that, I think that is the, the issue. Um, and it's unfortunate because Christian Zionism is, a, is a, it's almost like a political uh, theology that is more concerned about ushering the, you know, the second coming of the Messiah and end times than it is kingdom building. Um, which I would, that, that to me is the biggest message. It's what is our Christian witness to the world, to, to Palestinian Christians who are grieving, um, and to our Muslim brothers and sisters? Like, it's, it's as a Palestinian, I feel so embarrassed um, to know that in my, in my name, in my faith's name, um, we are more concerned about um, ushering in the second coming of the Messiah than we are about Maybe teaching right. um, the gospel uh, the love of Christ, um, and and that the fact that we are all made in the image of of Christ, and I wish that there was more, um, there were more Christian leaders that will give Palestinians a place to have a, a platform to share their narrative, uh, but they would also also guard their language because they've really harmed the Christian witness in the Middle East. But I'm gonna tell you another sorry another thing that's going on. Christianity here, Western Christianity, you know, as I say, my brother wrote is Christianity a, a white man's religion. Definitely get his book. It's good. You probably need a thesaurus and a dictionary when you read it, but because he uses these big words, but it's definitely a good book. It took me a long time because it, it's, it's so many big words. In there, seriously, but when you when you think about um, the, the the weaponization of Christianity, it's been weaponized here. First of all, people think Christianity started here. I'm glad you said where it started. It did not start in the West. We think it started in the West because the dominant culture says it. The dominant culture, Christians aren't thinking about the Jewish person, not thinking about the black person, not thinking about the Palestinian. The, even the image of Christ, the white, blue-eyed Jesus has been weaponized. First of all, God said, don't even make no images of me. But we do that because he, probably, he understood that when you do it, you weaponize. And that's the Jesus that they know, and that's the Jesus that they want. Now, 
if you were to get up here and say vote for this person or vote for that person, you might lose your nonprofit because they say you can't do political things. Now you can bring candidates in, let them talk, but you can't tell them who to vote for. But when Trump was running, because he stood for this, the evangelical type representation of what they wanted, all the big time, a lot of, I think say all, say I almost did all, like yeah, I almost did all. <laughs> a lot of the evangelical churches and, and, and pastors who I never seen involved in political things at all, pulled together with telling everybody to vote for Trump. No one threatened their nonprofit status. No one threatened their 501c3, but they galvanized. Even now, even though he's been convict, convicted as a felon or whatnot, they still are coming together. Like people I never have seen say anything political have been coming up and saying how the judicial system needs to be revamped. They didn't speak when Trayvon Martin got shot. They didn't speak when when things in Gaza happened. They didn't speak when when Israeli and things of that, those things happened. But 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 when Trump was convicted, here they come talking about the judicial system in America. But out of all the inequality, the judicial ser service uh, system in America is so unbalanced. They, they, they even let you know they have the scales unbalanced. If you look at the scales of justice, it's, it's one high and one low. They're letting you know that it's two different types of justice here in America. They're giving you the imagery of it. And so when I look at it, when you look at it, it's not just, it's, it's missing you and it's going to miss the more lower, not, not my thoughts, the more lower in their mind you are on the totem pole. You know, as far as dark and as far as Palestinian and as far as different countries, as far as the, the further you get away from the westernized look, the more oppressed, I believe, the Christian church becomes with the rhetoric sometimes. Because even if you look at the movie, The Book of Eli, it shows you how you can weaponize religion so much. They were fighting over the Bible all that time so they could take these words and be able to manipulate and control that city and control that town. So we as Christians, we as preachers, we as, 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 as elders, we as rabbis, we have to make sure that when we speak, we begin to speak from a place of love and not hate. You know what I'm saying? Try to not come from all our biases in such a matter that we just begin to push our race and our beliefs more than we push the love of Christ. And I just see how, I never realized how, like sitting well, right well, here, Christians I can see. Christians, the love of Christ, Christian, right? yeah, but I'm just saying, you know, but, <laughs> but even 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 uh, Gundy said it'd be more Christian if it went for the Christians, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, well you, so, I, just so, okay, I, and we gotta wrap this up because we wanna, because um, it's getting late and I wanna make sure we acknowledge Shabbat is coming on. But from what I heard you, hear you saying, I've been listening, there is a there is a political agency at work, right? Yes. Um, that I think that is undermining people and people groups. And then I don't want to ignore ways in which in this country, we've heard this consistently, Christianity has been um, hijacked by political agenda. Um, and oh, and we know that from our Black history, um, culture has hijacked. Christianity over and over and over again, and use Christianity as an agency for political uh, expediency. And I think we have to be responsible to that, acknowledge it, and also cry aloud, like the prophets say in the Hebrew Bible, cry aloud and spare not, right? We have to speak to that, right? There were, uh, slavery was sanctioned by Christian thought. I don't think it was proper Christian thought, um, and now you're saying that even in Christian churches, there are people, there are people in the pews who, and I, and you said it right, there is a political agency at work that is among those Christian thinkers that are ignoring the people who they should be extending love to. And I think that's important. And I think when we talk about anti-Semitism, something similar has happened. Something similar has happened. There is an attack on a people historically in this country that has not been taken seriously, consistently seriously. In the same way we hear in your story, it's the same thing in the Jewish community. People are not listening to the stories and taking it seriously. There should not be a Jew walking down the street afraid to wear 
his kippah for fear of who's going to shoot him and why. That's crazy. And you can raise the European flag. You can raise the, uh, I've seen many of the Brit flags. Nobody ever calls that into question. And so somehow to raise a flag of your home country out of um, sort of identity association suddenly means that it is, a, is against something else. So one has to shrink oneself in order to validate another. And I think that we really got to think that very seriously. And those of us in leadership positions need to be cognizant of how we are being used in political arms to harm people. And you really helped me because, you know, they have, you know, you have flags, you know, you have the keeper. And it's funny with black and the Israel flag. The Israel flag. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just yeah. saying. I'm not brave enough to put an Israel yeah. flag on my wall. But see, he didn't talk about it, so I just, I just <laughs> talked about. I'm really talking about what he said he wears and yeah. what she said she she flies. And the thing about it is, that we all are in a country. I mean, we are theologians. We are um, professional people. We are successful in what we do in life. You know, we're not struggling from check to check or anything. Well, yet. speak for yourself. Whatever, man. You know, I just you wanna... sold you a big house. So <laughs> <laughs> don't lie. We in church this time. We ain't at my house. So you in, <laughs> don't, don't lie in church. <laughs> so, but the thing about it is, so when you start, when you fly your flag, when you fly your, I'm going to say flags, because he want me to tell you flag, even though he told you he, he wears keeper, but he don't really fly his flag. But when, when you <laughs> talk about an American flag, when you, talk about do you flag, always agree with what America's doing? doing? I don't fly American flag. Let me talk. So... <laughs> So I don't I don't have a flag. You don't have a flag. I mean, at the end of the day, this is the thing. But when you talk about black love and you talk about love for yourself, some people feel like you attacking white people. If I say I love black people, I say I love my people. If I say, hey, I'm proud to be black, some people take it as if it's an attack on them. Just as they take it when they fly, when she flies her flag, they take it as an attack. When he does his symbolism, they take it as an attack. It's not that we don't love what we are or don't love our country or don't love our federal citizens. It's just, like you said, we have our own skin. We have our own personality. We have our own identity. Mm -hmm. And what I, what I really hope in this country is that Dr. King's dream comes to fruition where, you know, you are able to express your, your full self without feeling oppressed. And I, I, I don't want to say it makes me feel good because it doesn't, but the, to hear other people from different ethnic groups and different nationalities, different religions, I know you're my religion, but we doing certain things and, and we all are going through the same thing. And I'm not saying I'm proud that we have company, but it makes me understand that other people do understand the struggle of my people because there's other people in America that's not just black that go through the same things we go through. Cause I definitely didn't understand that Jews went through what we go through. I knew, yeah, I know they do have anti-Semitism, but I didn't know people didn't feel like your stuff was real. You understand? Because they tell us, they tell, they don't say anything. Most of the people I'm around don't say anything about if, if Jewish people teach about the Holocaust or what happens. But if we talk about black history, they want, it, they want to erase it from school. They want to erase it from the history. And when we remember that we came from slavery, they act like it's something we should just forget. So to hear you talk and hear you talk, it's, it's been very eye-opening. It's been, I'm not going to, I don't want to say refreshing, but it really helps me see the struggle that America is going through, not just with my people, but with our people. So thank you. So many people are suffering silently. Yes. And I think to have an opportunity to share your story should not be, one should not feel threatened as if they're going to lose their job. We feel this way. Yeah. Certain things you can't say because you know, keep your, when, you know, when I was growing up, they used to say, keep your head down, boy. Don't you talk, you talk too much. You be quiet now. Don't you be quiet. You up at that college, then you be quiet. You just say yes or now. You got your head say yes or Right. Because if you speak your truth or your story or your thoughts, and it, it, it is traumatic. Yeah. It is so traumatic. Don't be too smart. I know you was going crazy. They'll tell you, don't, don't say it too much because you don't want to show up and show out and look like you're <laughs> embarrassing uh, the white person that's, that's over you. And so you had to, a lot of times, dumb yourself down to be accepted because if you're saying something that makes sense and it's smart, they feel like you're being a smart, a smarty, like, yeah. like in a different way. But, but to have anyway, civil discourse, and we need to be able to man. disagree.
It's a, to be to disagree is not a bad thing. Um, and to not see things the same way needs to be seen as a gift. Yes. It's called civil discourse. Yeah. Now it's we can't even stressing yourself. People don't want to be stressed. If you agree with everything I agree with, then how will we grow? You can't well, grow. Well, see, that's how you and I are great friends because we never agree. So <laughs> at all. <laughs> That's why I was so amazed. I was like, wow, we agree. I'm so glad he has you and you. I just don't like to say, man, thank my colleague, man. I agree with him with this one. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for sharing your story and the story of your community. This is just so rich and thought provoking. And um, I hope we are able to do more of this um, in our community so that we can get to know and appreciate each other uh, deeper. Uh, I think that's the call of faith. No matter what tradition, the call of faith is to love and to express that love in ways that faith has not always cultivated. Um, so, thank you, awesome. Eric. Thank, thank you, Liza. Thank, thank you. Yes, thank you both.